12 seconds later. Welcome to my channel. The thing about living in an urban setting is that the trendiest things in fashion, pop culture, and tech tend to really get in your face. Talk of the town right now is Bitcoin, and Bitcoin seems to be on the lips of everyone and their dog. I feel it's worth understanding at least the basics of what everybody is talking about because sooner or later, it'll creep its way into conversation. So I took the pleasure of reading the Bitcoin white paper by Satoshi Nakamoto. And I'm here to summarize it for you. You could read the paper yourself or you could watch me talk for a few minutes. Either way, the link to the paper is down below in the description if you want to read it yourself. And after this video, if you would like to go and purchase some Bitcoin and you don't know where to start, I recommend using an exchange. And I have my referral link to the Gemini exchange as well. As a preamble, I am not a cryptographic expert. I'm just some person on the internet. And just like everything else in life, take what I have to say with a grain of critical thinking. So sit back, relax, and let's get started. So what I'm about to show you can be really daunting, but stay with me. We're in this together. Pinky promise. The Bitcoin white paper is outlined by these sections, which we will cover one by one. Say you wanted to buy a rubber ducky. You go to a store that has a rubber ducky. You pay with your card and you get the rubber ducky. The store goes to the bank that issues the card and says, Hey, where's my money, yo? The bank sees that you are the holder of this card and sees you are good for it. So the bank gives the store the money. This is a traditional transaction. What the Bitcoin paper points out is that this transaction requires a third party to complete it. If real money was being passed around, there's really no need for this third party. But you can't exactly pay with cash over the internet or any other communication line for that matter. And since real money isn't being put up front right away, this model relies on trust. The vendor trusts the bank and they accept your credit card and the bank trusts you when you say you have the money. But in order to have trust, the vendor must know the bank and the bank must know you. And what do you need in order to get to know somebody? Information. So the bank has all your information and background so it could be confident in your credibility. And because reputations are at stake, sometimes you end up giving more information than necessary. And there's the possibility of someone just faking the information or stealing somebody else's. There are a lot of other reasons why people would want to get rid of this central bank or mint. And this is a huge topic. It extends to social justice, politics, next generation technology, and so forth. But this is not what this video is about. This video is about the Bitcoin white paper. And what the Bitcoin white paper addresses is the ability to make an anonymous payment that is verified without having the need to have to trust the other person. Like I said, this could all be avoided if you just paid with cold hard cash. And this is what Bitcoin is trying to do without having that cold hard cash. So instead of a system based on trust, Bitcoin is establishing a system based on cryptographic proof. And what is cryptographic proof? Don't freak out, this is why you're watching this video. Later, we are going to cover what cryptographic proof is. Just know for now that cryptographic proof will prevent this fraud that we are talking about. And this leads us to the heart of the Bitcoin paper. Bitcoin was not the first electronic coin, but it was the first mainstream one. What Bitcoin did was solve problems that previous coins had. And one of them was double spending. But what is double spending? Say Anna has $5. She could either give this $5 to Bob or Lisa. Since she only has one $5 bill, she can only give it to one person. But what if that $5 was digital? What keeps Anna from making digital copies of this $5 bill and giving both Bob and Lisa $5? Doing so is called double spending. Imagine this is your electronic coin. This electronic coin is actually what many refer to as a ledger. And what is a ledger? It's simply a list. In the case of this ledger, this contains a list of digital signatures of each of the previous owner.
The problem with this is you can't really verify if any of these people didn't duplicate this list along the way and they double spent. If we go back to the original model with the bank or mint, it is the third party that does the verification. But the whole point of Bitcoin is to eliminate the third party. So there needs to be a way to know that all the other previous owners did not make another transaction. In the Bitcoin network, the earliest transaction is considered the legitimate transaction. So logically, to figure out which is the earliest transaction, you would have to know all the transactions. If there was a third party like a mint or a bank, they can keep track of all transactions and declare which one was the first. But again, we want to get rid of the third party. So to do this, all transactions have to be publicly announced and everyone has to agree which transaction is the real one. So two questions here. One, who is everybody? And two, how would they know which transaction came first? Let's start with the latter, proving which transaction came first. This is solved with a timestamp server, where each transaction is timestamped. Of course, it's a little more complicated than this because this involves layers of encryption and a certain digital engraving of the timestamp within the ledger. But the general idea is we're putting a timestamp in each transaction of this ledger. So a coin is used for this rubber ducky. This coin has been digitally signed, stamped, and broadcast out into the world. Now the question is, how can we prove that this is the one and only transaction and this coin has not been duplicated? To understand that this ledger is the legitimate one, we need to understand what a hash is. Now the Bitcoin white paper did not define what a hash is because it was first published to a community that already knew what hashes are. And so for your benefit, I am going to try to explain what a hash is. No, it's not that thing you have for breakfast, but we can imagine it's baked bread. In order to make bread, you need an oven. You put the ingredients together, put it in the oven, and out comes the bread. The ingredients are the items in your ledger, and the oven is a cryptographic function, and the bread is the hash. And just like bread can't go back into being dough, a cryptographic function can't be reverse computed. It's very easy to come up with a hash, but impossible to start with a hash and come up with the ingredients. Also, any changes that you put into the oven or function changes the hash. So now you know what a hash is. So now we have all the signatures and timestamps in a hash. This is the hash that is supposed to be stored into the Bitcoin network. But the Bitcoin network has a condition. The hash has to begin with a certain number of zeros to be accepted. Even though this is the correct hash for this legitimate ledger, we can't submit it into the Bitcoin network because the hash has no zeros in front of it. So we have to add some arbitrary content in order for the hash to change. This arbitrary content is called global group. No, but if you're really curious, this arbitrary content is called a nonce. But how do we know what arbitrary content to add to the ingredients to make sure that the hash has a certain number of zeros in the front of it? Well, there's only one way to do it. It has to be guessed. That's right, you heard me. It's a big guessing game. You have to take the ledger, throw in some arbitrary content and keep manipulating that until you come up with a hash that has the right amount of zeros needed to be accepted into the Bitcoin network. If you've ever heard of the term mining or crypto mining or mining for Bitcoin, this is what they're referring to. Because there's really no intelligent way around it, you just have to keep on guessing or keep on mining until you finally get that hash that you are looking for. This is called the proof of work, or the term that we were hyperventilating about earlier, cryptographic proof. I mean, you yourself don't have to do this if you own some Bitcoin. There's an entire network ready to play this guessing game. So what is this Bitcoin network and who's in it? Earlier, I mentioned that in a traditional model with a bank or mint, only the bank or mint is needed to declare transactions to be authentic. 
This is called centralized banking because all transactions go through a single institution. But with Bitcoin, where there is no bank or mint, transactions are broadcasted to everyone and everyone agrees that the transaction is legitimate. But who is this everyone? This is what is called decentralized banking. It is basically a network made up of nodes and a node is basically a computer. And who runs all these computers or nodes? Anybody can. You yourself could be a node if you have enough computing power on your computer. You can participate in this network. So let's start from the top. A transaction is made, it is broadcast to all the nodes. Each node tries very hard to find a specific bread recipe that will produce the right hash with the right amount of zeros in front of it. When a node finds that recipe that works, it will broadcast it to all the other nodes. All the other nodes will check it. And if it is correct, all the other nodes will keep a copy of that transaction. Each node keeps a running list of all transactions, one attached to the other forming a chain. The paper goes on to talk about what if two versions are broadcasted. Both versions are saved until one ledger becomes longer. And this is where it becomes difficult to duplicate that digital $5 bill I was talking about earlier. Say that Anna did duplicate that digital $5 bill and spent it twice. Well, that ledger that has the second transaction, which is the fake one, would have to keep up with the first ledger. Since each transaction needs the difficult to bake hash, sooner or later that fake ledger won't be able to catch up. It actually takes a lot of computing power and electricity to come up with that hash that all the nodes are looking for. So why would anybody want to participate and be a node in this network to help verify transactions? New coins are created and awarded to the first node that can find that bread recipe. So when you are mining for that bread recipe, you are really mining for Bitcoin. But like I said, the process of mining Bitcoin takes up a lot of computing power and electricity. That's why not a lot of people do it. The first 50 Bitcoin was said to be created by Satoshi Nakamoto. Nobody really knows who Satoshi really is or if they are a real person. Some suggest that it could be a group of people. So the first 50 Bitcoins was created to get the network started. And if you look up the wallet of the first 50 Bitcoin, you'll see that it hasn't really been spent. Back when Bitcoin was created in 2009, the reward for figuring out that bread recipe was 50 Bitcoins. About every four years, that reward gets cut in half. You might have heard of the term the halvening or the great halvening. This is what they're referring to. The last halvening happened on May 11th, 2020, and the reward for that bread recipe was 6.25 Bitcoins. The next halvening is happening on May 6, 2024, and the reward is going to be 3.125 Bitcoins. This reward will keep getting cut in half until there is no more Bitcoin to be created, thus making Bitcoin a limited currency the way we look at gold. And if you do the math, there will only ever be 21 million Bitcoins ever. And the paper suggests that once that 21 million Bitcoin has been created, the people mining for that bread recipe could be awarded through transaction fees. All this record keeping does take up a lot of hard drive space. This portion of the paper simply states how to keep file size down by indicating at what point parts of the chain could be deleted. I don't feel that we need to go over this too much in detail, just like the timestamp server, but that's the overall concept. And this portion of the paper just talks about a shortened way of doing transactions, where a transaction doesn't have to go through an entire ledger, but merely a branch of it. And this is called a Merkle branch. Again, this section has a lot of technical globity gloop, but that's the general concept of it. It would be very cumbersome if every single cent was considered a transaction. So a transaction doesn't necessarily have to be one input or one payment. A transaction could look like either one single large payment, multiple small payments, or one payment and one change back. 
In the traditional model, there's a certain level of privacy between seller and merchant because the central bank steps in and mediates between the two. When you buy that rubber ducky, the merchant doesn't need to know your social security number, your date of birth, mother's maiden name, favorite color, astrological sign. No, the bank holds all that information. The merchant just needs to know your credit card information. By using Bitcoin, all transactions are public. However, names are not attached to transactions. But if you tell people what your Bitcoin wallet is, they could easily look up transactions associated with that wallet. So if you bought antifungal foot cream with that Bitcoin wallet, well then your athlete's foot situation is no longer a secret. So what keeps someone from just making up their own ledger and making Bitcoin out of thin air? This portion of the paper presents the calculation of how improbable it is for someone to actually keep up the charade in maintaining a fake ledger. To summarize it all, Bitcoin is an electronic payment system that does not rely on trust but on cryptographic proof and is protected against double spending. In closing, Bitcoin lately has been used more as an investment like stock rather than a currency. There are many other electronic currencies out in the market today. And on that note, I just wanted to point out that Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash are two different things. And oh lordy, that's another topic for another day. If you want to purchase Bitcoin, I recommend using an exchange. And I use Gemini Exchange. My referral link is down in the description below. We'll both get $10 worth of Bitcoin if you invest $100. And if you have trouble setting up a Bitcoin wallet or purchasing Bitcoin, their customer service is very responsive and very helpful. If this video was useful to you, please consider sharing it with someone you know who's interested in Bitcoin or cryptocurrency in general. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel. Until next time, thank you so much for watching.